inspired by did a project on the Mojave Desert. And while doing it, I learned that there were loads of exclusive plants in the Mojave Desert which are thrived on very little water. And I know how you're interested in droughts and how they may wipe out uh, plant life. Do you think plants may have to adjust to what the plants are doing in the Mojave Desert if uh, uh, the world just keeps on getting hotter. I mean, in Australia, we've also got some, some really drought-adapted plants growing in the centre. And it's, it's kind of disturbing when you go walking around in Tasmania in a dry year and you see plants that are hundreds and sometimes thousands of years old dying in, because of drought. And when you see that, you sort of realise that these are events that are, are really unusual. Um, for these species. So I think that's right. If we keep getting these very dry years, and this is not a very good year to make this speech, but in a really dry year, we keep sort of getting this erosion and these species becoming killed by drought, because each species can only survive a certain type of drought. So if it gets, when you get to a threshold, a whole suite of species will, will die. And if you put all the Tasmania rainforest things in the Mojave Desert, they last about 10 minutes and then they'll all be dead. So for the same reason, that if we get a really dry event, like if it doesn't rain on the west coast for two weeks, if it just stops raining, like on the west coast in some places it rains almost every day, if it suddenly sort of stops raining for two weeks, well, all the plants up there look like they're just about ready to turn up their toes and die. So these are, there are a lot of very, very sensitive things, and it's a very good question because it's, it's something that I, I totally agree. I think there will be a lot of a change in, in the way and the distribution of plants, and if they can't move fast, they'll just become extinct. And that will be the last we see of Excellent. Hi, I'm Corey Peterson, Sustainability Manager at the University of Tasmania, and I'm here today to chat with these lovely students about bike structures and parking and shelters and electric charging points and all the exciting things we don't currently have. Uh, as you can see behind us, we have bike parking at the university. Much of it is in the mud. In the landscaping, people have to randomly tie up against all sorts of things. They take their bikes inside as well. We probably have somebody trying to get to his bike right now. <laughs> and what we're trying to do here at the university is actually cater to the needs of our bike riding contingent, plus add more bike riders preferably. So we were going to be adding new facilities that are undercover, that are secured with swipe card access, have CCTV security added, uh, there'll be some lockers for gear storage, uh, what else we're putting in there, water bottle filling stations, we'll have a maintenance station uh, with various tools and supplies available for people that ride their bikes and then of course for those that forget their swipe cards and can't get in we'll have some bike parking easily accessible on the outside of the secured area as well. Yeah, my name's John Hunter and I work for the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre and what I work on is sea level rise and I don't know if you know but when the, uh, the world's going to be warming and that's because we've put uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere we've increased the amount of greenhouse gases and with the world warming what that does is also make sea level rise and the reason that sea level rises is because of two reasons one is that uh, if you warm water up this is like you warm up a liquid in a thermometer you'll find that the, uh, the water expands, so that's one way in which sea level will rise. What also happens is if you uh, warm up the ice on the land, you'll melt some of that and some of that ice goes into the sea. So the glaciers and ice caps in Antarctica and Greenland, they're going to be melting and supplying some extra water to the oceans. So that's why sea level is rising. Uh, what I'm interested in is how much it's risen in the past and how much it's going to rise in the future. And the way you're going to see sea level rising, it's not going to rise smoothly. You're not just going to see it gradually coming up and make your feet wet. What you're going to see is that the big flooding events, when you see on the, on the, in the news say that uh, somewhere's got flooded, and you'll have seen in the newspaper yesterday probably, uh, uh, houses in Lauderdale getting flooded, um, you'll see that happening more and more often as sea level rises. And this is the main way in which you'll, you'll see that sea level's rising. You'll see that these nasty events the ones that flood your houses are going to be happening more often. So they may only be happening once every 20 years at the moment. By the end of next century, it will be happening every year. Would sea level rising change the currents? 
Um, it's sort of the other way around really, it's the, with, with global warming you change the oceans and that changes things like the currents, you change the temperature of the ocean and you change the currents, you change the height of the ocean. So all those things happen at once, so it's, uh, it's like um, uh, with the weather the same thing, so with climate change it'll change things like the wind and temperature, rainfall, they'll all change. So it's not rainfall changing the temperature, and so it's not sea level changing the currents, it's the, the whole lot is being changed by climate change. Is that okay? Um, people started measuring sea level in Port Arthur very early. When and where was the first device or ruler or something to measure sea level in Hobart? Okay, that was in um, just uh, near CSRO down in Salamanca. If you go down to CSRO and just walk across the road from the building, you'll see a little white hut perched up on the top of a wall, and that's where they put the original tide gauge in in 1889. A lot of that land has been reclaimed from the sea, so it's not all solid. So the big the, the CSRO building is actually up on stilts in the water, so you can actually take a boat underneath the CSRO building, and um, you can still you can still put a tide gauge in in that little hut. There's still a, a, a tunnel goes underneath the road. And there's still a hole if you actually peer, peer through the window. You're not supposed to do that. But if you go and ask them nicely at the house, whether you can look in the window, you'll see there's a little hole in the ground, and that goes through into a tunnel, which goes right down out to the sea. So you can still measure sea level there if you wanted to. When I first arrived in Hobart, there was a gauge there. This was in 18... in sorry. 19? <laughs> 1989. <laughs> in, 19, 1990s, in the 1990s, there was a tide gauge there. We have uh, the deepest, the oldest ice core in Antarctica was drilled by uh, the a European community um, and it goes back uh, 870,000 years. And so we can study all the changes that have happened in the earth back then to, to understand the dynamics of the climate system, how the climate changes, what, what, what changes happened at that point in time when we went from a, a cold world to a warmer world and we can use that to help us model what might happen in the future as we move to a warmer world. Guys, I'm just bringing me because I'm all just like... <laughs> Look at you, you're stupid. I am, I've got awful, I've got it's awful. It's Tom for I asking... Really you got a play for it. For asking the best question, Tom gets to hold the whole ice floor. Oh, 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 can I get the answer? What would happen if I dropped it? I get the answer. Don't you dare, there's how many million years you can hold this one. Uh -huh. So, so this is uh, an Antarctic oh. ice floor. And you guys are very privileged that we have this in here, and we don't normally let a lot of people um, touch the ice cores. We usually have cores like this for when we get guests like the Prime Minister or various people coming down who are very important. That's a very good question. So, what we have here is um, a face mask, which you can put on, uh, and that will stop any fluids um, from you if you're leaning over the ice from, from dripping down. And then you have you would normally be wearing warm clothing in there, so you have a warm glove, um, and then. <laughs> You have another glove. And if you have five fingers, it should fit in. And so, so this way, then we have a, of of keeping um, any contamination from your hands, so you can move and touch the cores and collect all the samples that way. So this protects you from your hands, this protects you from the nose, and the rest of your body you, you'd be wearing warm clothing um, on the outsides, uh, which we have specifically for working in here. Why do you have to clean your shoes when you go in? Into the freezer. Um, the, this mat here, which you, can, you might be able to hear that on camera, it's um, cleaning the dirt off the bottom of my shoes. And the reason that is important is because Antarctica is a, is a very clean place and we're measuring tiny, tiny concentrations uh, in the ice cores. Um, we look at things in parts per billion. That's one part per billion parts of water. So we're, and then we're looking at small changes in that um, through time. So 
we have to avoid contaminating the ice that we're measuring here with any dirt that we bring from the outside. So what's on the bottom of my shoe here today is probably the total amount of dust that would be in one storm in Antarctica. So we have to try and take this contamination away. So we do a series of steps um, to do that. This is one of the first steps and then um, we'll move into the, to the freezer and we can show you some, some other things that we do to minimise contamination.